Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Newsline at Noon, as South Korean victims of forced labor seek compensation from Japanese companies, the Seoul government unveils decades-old documents detailing Koreans victimized during Japan's colonial rule in the early 20th century. The UN General Assembly's Human Rights Committee passes a series of resolutions on rights abuses in Syria, Iran, North Korea and Myanmar. The resolution on the North calls for the release of hundreds of thousands of political prisoners. Plus, a Lebanon-based Sunni jihadist group linked to Syrian rebels carries out twin suicide bombings at the Iranian embassy in Beirut killing at least 22 and injuring scores. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. Where's the best place for beef and bop? Les Jeux Olympiques d'hiver se dérouleront-ils à Pyeongchang? Are you the best player in the world? Who is the best player in the world? Hello, the most popular player in the world recently. Korea is attracting interest from around the world. The more you know, the more you want to know. Dynamic Korea. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Choi Yuzan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. The Korean government has unveiled a new stack of decades-old documents containing evidence of Japan's colonial-era atrocities. Our Hwang Sung-yi explains how the revelations come as more victims here in Korea are stepping efforts to claim private compensation. <laughs> The 67 volumes of documents unveiled by the National Archives of Korea on Tuesday list more than 200,000 victims from Japan's colonial rule of Korea in the early 1900s. They include those killed during the March 1st independence movement and the Kanto massacre, as well as those forced into labor by Japan's colonial authorities. The documents contain detailed information that had not previously been disclosed. It is expected to be useful in determining the candidates eligible for compensation as it provides information like their dates of birth and addresses, which were unavailable in previous documents. The documents were found at the South Korean embassy in Tokyo in June and are believed to have been prepared in the 1950s to be used in negotiations between South Korea and Japan. The findings come as South Korean victims of forced labor are seeking compensation from Japanese companies, and they're expected to serve as key evidence since 65 of the 67 documents contain information on forced workers. While Japan claims that the issue of compensation for forced labor was settled under a bilateral agreement in 1965, South Korean courts have ruled that the individual rights of South Koreans to seek compensation remain intact. Seoul's foreign ministry said the new documents once again highlight the wartime crimes committed by Japan. It shows once again how much wrong Japan did during its colonial rule of Korea. Japan must acknowledge this fact. The government is currently conducting a thorough review of the documents and already it has identified more than a thousand victims who were previously unknown. And it expects to confirm more victims of Japan's colonial era once it goes through all the documents. Hwang Sagi, Arirang News. Staying with Japan's denial of its colonial era atrocities, the co Korean government has called on Japan to repent for its imperialistic aggression after a top Japanese official publicly defamed one of Korea's most highly respected independence fighters. Japanese Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga on Tuesday called An jung a criminal for assassinating the first Japanese Governor General of Korea, Hirobumi Ito. Expressing deep regret, Korea's foreign ministry said such remarks should never be made when considering Japan and Ito's imperialistic acts on neighboring nations. China has also waded into the row, calling on a well-respected figure in China for his work as an anti-Japanese activist. Korea and China have been working to establish a monument commemorating An. 
A UN committee didn't think twice Tuesday about passing a resolution against North Korea's blatant disregard for even the most basic human rights. North Korea rejected the resolution, saying it was cooked up by the US. Syria, Iran and Myanmar were also reprimanded by the UN committee. Kim Hyun Bin reports. The UN General Assembly's Human Rights Committee has unanimously passed a resolution against what it calls systematic, widespread and grave human rights violations in North Korea. The committee on Tuesday cited reports of torture, the death penalty for political and religious reasons, and numerous political prison camps. The resolution was jointly proposed by 49 countries, including South Korea, the U.S. and the European Union. The resolution calls on Pyongyang to immediately halt human rights violations and close down all political prison camps. The resolution will now go to the General Assembly for final approval next month, where it will almost certainly pass. The diplomat representing North Korea rejected the resolution, saying it was cooked up by hostile organizations funded by the United States to change the leadership in the North. Human rights in North Korea are heavily restricted, there is no freedom of speech, and broadcasting and news is owned by the government. Experts say there are nearly 200,000 political prisoners detained in concentration camps, where they are subject to forced labor, constant beatings, torture and execution. The human rights situation in North Korea is under constant international scrutiny by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and the United Nations. The UN General Assembly has adopted a resolution condemning North Korea's human rights record every year since 2003. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Tensions between South Korea's ruling and opposition parties remain high as day two of a five-day parliamentary questioning session got underway earlier today. The already broad differences between the two parties were exacerbated by a scuffle earlier this week between opposition lawmakers and presidential security staff. Kim Yeon-ji reports. The members of President Park Geun-hye's cabinet are taking the stand at the National Assembly this Wednesday to answer questions about the government's security and North Korea policies. This session is focused on allegations that the military cyber command unit posted negative comments about opposition candidates on Twitter during the last presidential campaign, as well as the postponement of the transfer of wartime operational control from the U.S. to Korea. Tensions remain high at the parliament as the rival parties continue to bicker over a range of issues. The ruling Senate Party says that it cannot accept the opposition's demand for a special probe into allegations that state institutions, including the spy agency and the military, meddled in last year's presidential election. But the main opposition Democratic Party says there must be an investigation in order to bring the near one-year controversy to an end. The first day of the interpolation session at the National Assembly on Tuesday was cut short after Democratic Party lawmakers walked out to protest the ruling party's claim that one of their colleagues was to blame for a scuffle the previous day. The Monday scuffle between DP lawmaker Kang Gi jong and a presidential security officer broke out shortly after President Park had left the National Assembly following a policy speech. Demanding that presidential security staff remove their vehicles from outside the main National Assembly building, Kang kicked one of the parked cars. A security officer stepped out of the car and grabbed the DP lawmaker by the back of his neck. Then, a group of DP lawmakers who had come out of the main building to launch a rally against the Park administration intervened, and the security officer ended up being hit in the mouth. During the parliamentary session on Tuesday, a ruling party lawmaker claimed that it was the DP lawmaker who grabbed the security officer by the collar, prompting all of the DP lawmakers to leave the room en masse in protest. The Democratic Party demanded the presidential office apologize for the matter, saying that it was the security officer who grabbed Kang by the neck and twisted his arm, knowing that he was an assembly member. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. And staying with domestic politics, ruling Senate Party lawmaker John Moon Hon has confirmed that he legally obtained and read the controversial 2007 Intergreen Summit transcript as he was the Presidential Office Secretary for Unification at that time. Zhang faced over 10 hours of prosecutors questioning Tuesday over suspicions he obtained and leaked classified transcripts of the summit. 
Zhang caused controversy in the run-up to last December's presidential election by alleging that late President No Mi Hun suggested making concessions over the western sea border during his talks with then North Korean leader Kim Jong Il. Another ruling party lawmaker, Kim Mu Song, was questioned last week, but Zhang denied he gave his fellow lawmaker additional information about the transcript before the presidential race when it was classified. If you live in Korea, you may notice a difference in your electricity bill starting this month. The government is raising rates by an average of over 5% from Thursday to rein in consumption and reduce the risk of power shortages. Our Han Daeun has the details. Korea has raised electricity rates for the first time in 10 months by the biggest margin in three years in an attempt to reduce the nation's ever-rising energy consumption. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy announced on Tuesday that it'll raise electricity rates by an average of 5.4 percent starting this Thursday. Rates for the industrial sector will see the biggest jump by 6.4 percent. Electricity rates for general use, mainly for large office and department store buildings, will rise 5.8 percent and those for households will increase by 2.7 percent. It's the nation's first step in trying to streamline the current energy rate system, which has long been criticized for being inefficient. The aim of the energy rate system reform is to fundamentally solve problems stemming from the nation's excessive energy consumption by rationalizing the pricing system between electricity and other forms of energy. Officials added that the relative inexpensiveness of electricity prices in Korea has led to an abnormal increase in energy consumption, which could eventually result in power shortages. And taking into account public criticism that electricity rates for industrial use have been significantly lower than those for households, officials said they adjusted the rates for private consumption by the lowest level possible. From next year, the government also plans to impose an individual consumption tax on electricity generating flaming coal while reducing taxes on LNG and kerosene oil, which can be used as alternatives to electricity. And then, added a news. The Korean government has set Korea's economic growth forecast for 2014 higher than the world's average growth rate, as forecast by the OECD. Finance Minister Hyun Oseok said Tuesday that Korea's growth forecast has been set lower than the world's average every year for the last decade, apart from 2010. Earlier this month, the government fixed next year's economic growth outlook at 3.9 percent, 0.3 percentage points higher than the world's economic growth outlook for next year. The government plans to stimulate domestic demand through job creation, boosting investment and stimulating private consumption. The OECD has released its latest economic forecast for Korea, reflecting lower expectations for the country's growth rate in 2014. The new report, however, expressed confidence the country would still be able to break out of its economic slump in the coming year. Paul Lee explains. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development says that Korea's economy will pick up in 2014 as it continues to recover from a prolonged economic slowdown. According to the OECD's economic forecast released Tuesday, the local economy will find its greatest gains from a rebound in global exports and business investment over the next two years. The biannual report that assesses economic trends showed that Korea's gross domestic product is expected to post a 2.7 percent growth rate on year for 2013, up one-tenth of a percent from its estimate back in May. As for its 2014 economic forecast, the OECD said Korea's GDP would jump 3.8 percent in 2014 on-year. That's slightly lower from earlier this year, due in part to concerns over the nation's high level of household debt. The Paris-based organization said the mounting household debt problem is likely to hamper private consumption growth through 2015. Other concerns included Korea's declining working age population and falling prices in the housing market.
The report did acknowledge that the Korean government is addressing these issues head on with stimulus packages that include tax relief measures and restructuring personal debt. In comparison to other major economies, the OECD ranks Korea's future economic growth rate near the top of the list. Output growth is projected to stay within the 4% range in both 2014 and 2015, thanks to a moderate increase in world trade. Though Korea remains sensitive to global economic conditions due to its reliance on exports, the OECD says the country's budget surplus and low public debt will lay the foundation for faster growth and help it weather market uncertainties in the near future. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Korea has been elected as a member of member state of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee for the third time since it first joined the group in 1997. During the elections at UNESCO headquarters in Paris on Tuesday, Seoul received 104 votes from the organization's 173 member countries. Korea's new four-year term starts December 1st. Seoul's Cultural Heritage Administration and the Foreign Ministry say Korea's re-election was the result of the country's commitment and dedication to helping protect world heritage, they added. It would enable Korea to take a leading role in deciding whether or not to inscribe a property on the world heritage list. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. At least 22 people were killed and more than 140 injured Tuesday in a double suicide bombing outside the Iranian embassy in Beirut. Iran's official news agency says the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon was not hurt, but the cultural attaché of the embassy was among the dead. Iran backs the Lebanese Shia militant group Hezbollah, which has sent fighters to Syria to help the Assad regime. A Sunni jihadist group with close links to the Syrian rebels has claimed responsibility for the attack. The UN Security Council condemned the bombings and the U.S. said the attack was senseless and despicable. The plane crash that killed all 50 people on board on Sunday at Russia's Kazan airport was most likely caused by pilot error. Russia's Interstate Aviation Committee released a preliminary report on Tuesday saying faulty landing maneuvers performed by the pilots are to blame for the accident. Data recorder analysis revealed that the pilots had tried but failed to reach the landing strip in one approach. Why is not yet clear. They then put the engines at maximum power to raise the nose of the plane, causing the jet to lose speed. But it was too late and the plane plunged into the ground at a near vertical angle. The CEO of Tatarstan Airlines, which operated the commercial flight, told reporters that the lead pilot had never made a second landing attempt under real flight conditions. At least one person is dead and up to 50 others remain trapped under rubble after a half-built shopping mall collapsed Tuesday near the South African city of Durban. Local reports say the building was still under construction when the roof collapsed, trapping builders in underneath. Scores of rescue workers are at the scene and at least 29 people, some with very serious injuries, have been taken to hospital. A local official says a court order had been obtained last month to block construction at the mall. Authorities claim they didn't know work had restarted. International banking giant JP Morgan Chase has agreed to pay 13 billion US dollars to resolve related charges surrounding the quality of mortgage-backed securities it sold in the run-up to the 2008 financial crisis. The settlement, the highest amount ever paid by one single company to the US government, brings to an end weeks of negotiations between JP Morgan and related government agencies. Four billion of the total will be directed to struggling homeowners with $2 billion going to reduce the balance of mortgages in areas hit hardest by foreclosures. JP Morgan also admitted its employees knowingly sold loans to investors that were much riskier than the bank claimed. JP Morgan is not out of the woods yet. It faces at least nine other government probes from its hiring practices in China, 
to its involvement in the LIBOR interest rate rigging scandal. Back here in Korea, and the safety of high-rise buildings has been called into question after a privately owned helicopter slammed into the side of a tall apartment block in southeastern Seoul last weekend. Song Ji Son reports. Investigations are still underway to determine what caused a helicopter to crash into a residential high-rise last Saturday. But the incident has raised concerns about the safety of skyscrapers in the capital especially since even taller buildings are under construction. I'm at Tamsil in eastern Seoul, in front of what will eventually be the tallest building in Korea at 123 stories high. It will be completed within the next two years, but its construction is raising more concerns about the safety and hazards of super high-rise buildings. The new building is among a dozen of Seoul's super high-rise buildings taller than 50 stories, but it's stirring controversy since it's located near Seoul Airport, Korea's Air Force Base where the president routinely flies out of. The government has revised the airport's runway so it will not conflict with the building, but that has not allayed concerns. The problem is position, because the position where this, the second rocket world is located is near the route where this airplane takes off and lands, or altitude, the airplane passage by the building is around 280 meters. But when it's like 555 meters high, as you can see, the airplane flies almost in the waist side, almost in between half. The Lotte Group says there are currently no plans to revise the blueprint of the Lotte Super Tower. Some say the government's regulations on high-rise buildings are in line with other countries. After a fire broke out at a skyscraper in Busan in 2009, the government enacted a special law on high-rise buildings. The law came into effect last year, and since then, all super high-rise buildings must abide by the regulation. It requires evacuation floors and fire escape elevators, as well as other measures to prepare for the case of tsunamis, earthquakes, and even terror attacks. Skyscrapers will continue to rise on Seoul's skyline to make the most out of Korea's limited land space, but the public wants to ensure the safety of nearby buildings and local residents comes first. Song ji Arirang News. Right, well, it was certainly a very chilly morning uh, earlier on. And let's see whether this cold spell is going to ease up anytime soon by going over to our Ijian. He is on standby, as, as always, at our weather center. Good afternoon to you, Gian. Well, good afternoon, Mark and Yusa. Now, the winter chill in the air feels stronger by the day, don't you think? Yes, and yesterday, Tian, you told us that wearing a scarf can right. raise a person's body temperature by mm. 5 degrees. Right, so right. do you have any other tips of course, for to stay warm? Yeah. Of course I do. Well, uh, wearing long underwear could also help uh, because it could raise our body temperatures 3 degrees. Also, uh, wearing several lighter layers will keep us warmer than very thick ones. So please keep that in mind and dress warmly before heading out as another chilly afternoon is in store for us today. Uh, but the sky will stay mainly clear throughout the day across the nation. But even with the strong sunlight, it won't feel any mild. So please stay bundled up all day long. Now tomorrow should be similar or a tad milder than today as Seoul will get up to 9 degrees Celsius. That's 3 degrees higher than today under lots of sunshine. So what about the rest of the week? Well, moving into weekend, we can expect a small 
while warm up with uh, low temperatures rebounding into the positives. But first, we have a couple more days of sub-zero temperatures. Uh, we didn't mind, here are the readings for this afternoon. Well, so we'll make it up to 6 degrees Celsius, which is 43 degrees in Fahrenheit, while Gwangju sees a high of 9, and uh, Busan will be peaking out at 11. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will get up to 12, Daejeon and Tukdo will top out at 8 and 7 respectively, and Mount Kunga will be a cold minus 3. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. That's all for me today, and back to you guys in the studio. Thank you very much, Gion. And uh, that's it for this Wednesday edition of Newsline at Noon. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow at noon. And do stay with Arirang TV for more on the day's headlines.